This is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins, and here to introduce our very special guest is my co-host, Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Uh, we're great, great fans of the playwright Edward Albee, and this coming season uh, in New York, you're going to have a lot of great plays of his to choose from. Coming up at second stage very soon is a play called Peter and Jerry. It's running now. It's running now, yes, um, which is, uh, the second act is the zoo story, the play that uh, began Edward's career, and the first act is a new play he's written called Home Life, which is sort of the setup to the zoo story. Uh, uh, later on this fall, you're going to see me, myself, and I at the McCarter Theater that we hope will be transferring to New York at some point. There is a revival of The American Dream and Sandbox at the Cherry Lane that Edward will be directing. And in the spring, uh, Occupant, a play of his about his friend Louise Nevelson that was supposed to have been seen in New York a few years ago with Anne Bancroft. Uh, but Edward is bringing that back now, and we're happy that all these shows are here, and we're delighted that he himself, Edward Albee, is our guest tonight on Theater Talk. There's one thing we ought to straighten up right yes. now. Yes, <laughs> Somebody's going to get the crazy idea or the depressing idea that since I'm having a birthday yeah. this year, <laughs> right. that somehow I set up all of these productions as, <laughs> as a self-celebration. So, I mean, it's, it's nice to turn 80, you know, better than not being able to. Yes. But I didn't have anything to do with any of these productions. It's all wonderful accident that, that it's happening. That it's all coming. So it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a con job or anything. I want to talk about Peter and Jerry, but I want to begin actually with the zoo story. Okay. Um, the play that um, began your career, really. Uh, you were just telling me you wrote it, and I think I remember from reading in Mel Gusso's biography of you, uh, 238 West 4th Street. 4th Street, where you lived in the village at the time. With seven or eight of my closest friends. Yeah. Oh, really? So was it a sort tiny of... Tiny little apartment, you know. Yeah. Sleep fast, we need the beds. One of those situations. <laughs> <laughs> you were 30 years old. Mm -hmm. Well, no, I was 28, actually. You were 28 when you... Okay. Yeah. It was produced when you were... 30. 30, right. Yeah. So you were 28 years old, and... There's a very good chapter in Mel's book about your life in, in Greenwich Village and being around artists, your friends. It friend. was such an exciting time. Yeah. I, I left home. I was an, an adopted kid and right. hated my adoptive family and the whole environment, though they did give me a very good education. Mm -hmm. And so I left home when I legally could when I was 18. And I got disowned, disinherited, and you know, pretty much broke, but I moved to New York. That huge distance between Larchmont and New York City, 20 miles. Mm. It, it, it's a million miles, and I, and I moved straight to Greenwich Village. And I lived there for uh, the 10 years until I wrote the zoo story, and then afterwards, having the most wonderful time of my life. Mm -hmm. Everybody talks about, uh, you know, the difficult period. It wasn't difficult. Yeah. I was getting to see all the most wonderful theater imaginable. We were seeing Beckett and Brecht and Pirandello, and, and everybody it was wonderful. And, and the abstract expressionist painters were painting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That was new, and all the, the new music was Copeland being done, was writing, done up to Columbia. Yeah, yeah. And we'd go up there for the, for the concerts. Nothing cost anything. <laughs> right. and, Gusso, and everybody Gusso. sat around and liked everybody, had a wonderful time. Yeah. Gusso describes you as a very quiet and retiring young man. Well, I was, I was there to learn a lot. That you were just taking it in, and people were then surprised when you turned out to be so articulate, that you had so much to say, that, because you were so, so quiet. Well, if you sit around for 10 years, you learn a few things, and then, <laughs> then I suppose you feel you can open your mouth. Well, I was curious. But Mel did you lack confidence in those days to speak up, or was it? I didn't think in terms of confidence. I was mm -hmm. a fairly shy kid. Yeah, that's what I mean. But there was so much fascinating going on yeah. all over the village and all of the arts and, and so many interesting people to learn stuff from. So I just sat around and absorbed a great deal of stuff. I but was, I was think, learning all the time. Now, you were a poet, correct? Oh, I started off as a poet and uh, failed at that. And I failed as a novelist. And I failed as a short story writer. And I failed as an essayist. But you're and not really I, failing. You're learning how to write, though, of doing course. all those. But within you, were you going, I'm going to tell you something someday? I don't remember. Well, here's, here's, what I, here, I just want, here's something that um, um, Mel says that I found quite interesting. Um, he says, uh, was Edward a writer or simply an observer, destined to play a secondary role in other people's lives? Increasingly, there was a feeling of emptiness and perhaps the idea that he would become another creator who never lived up to his potential. As Edward himself said several years later, he was fed up with everything, including myself. Is that a fair assessment well, of where you were at that I, point? I hadn't like? written anything that was worthwhile. I mean, I, I've always been pretty good at, at knowing whether stuff is good or bad, myself or other people's. And I knew all the poetry and the, and the novels and the short stories and the essays were crap. I, I knew that they weren't any good, but I, I knew that I wanted to be a writer, 
Mm -hmm. And so I wrote the zoo story, and I thought, you know, this is somewhat better. And you wrote the zoo story in two weeks, is that correct? Well, Sydney, probably three. At the kitchen Two and table. a half, two and a half. I, I, I had stolen, or liberated as I call it, a big typewriter from the Western Union Company where, where, you I, was, where I was delivering telegrams. Right, right, right. And I lugged that. How I ever got it up those stairs, I don't know. Back, <laughs> back to the apartment where we were all living. And I wrote the zoo story there in about two and a half weeks, yeah. And it just seemed to pour out. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing was, I knew when I finished that play that this was different. Mm. This was something that wasn't bad. Mm -hmm. This had some merit. Mm -hmm. And I was always objective about my work. And I knew the other stuff wasn't any good, but this was. Mm. So for our viewers who aren't familiar with the zoo story, who perhaps, would that be? Well, <laughs> but just it's not a law. It doesn't your, have to be. I don't know. <laughs> in your, in, what would you tell us that the zoo story is about? What happens in the zoo? Well, story? It's about an hour. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I'm. You've used that before. Yes. <laughs> it, it, what is it about? It's an, so I say it's an encounter between. It is two about men. a man who is, works for a publishing house, mm -hmm. uh, reading in, in New York Central Park back in the days when it wasn't worth your life to be sitting in Central Park <laughs> yes, reading. Yes. Uh, a man who has got a placid well-organized, well-ordered life mm -hmm. is accosted by a man named Jerry, who is exactly the opposite of him, who engages Peter in under, trying to understand this guy's life, refuses, pretends he doesn't understand, mm -hmm. which drives this guy, Jerry, to violence and ends up with Peter unintentionally killing the stranger, Jerry. Yeah, still, of still a power, powerful, End powerful of work. And End of second act. Of and play. why? <laughs> and, 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 and why? Why did it catch on so? Why was it? Why was it so successful? Do you believe? Why was this a breakthrough for for, for you? For me, it was breakthrough for me because it was the first halfway decent thing I'd ever written. Right. But why was it accepted as yes. well as it was? Yeah. Well, I had a pretty good companion piece on the bill with that. It was called Crap's Last Tape by Sam Beckett. <laughs> oh, well, you're too modest. Which, which, which didn't <laughs> Mr. hurt. Mr. Beckett brought you through. Well, some of the reviews liked uh, the Beckett play a lot more than mine. Some of the others liked my play a lot more than the Beckett play. Mm -hmm. But uh, this was a pretty healthy time off Broadway. It was just really beginning to get going. And, and here was uh, a master like Beckett and, and a young playwright who apparently had written a play that, that amounted to something. Mm -hmm. And it was a pretty good combo. We, was... ran, we ran for almost three years. I want to get into home life in a second, but I was just curious um, when you said that the two radically different people, Peter lives a very comfortable middle class mm -hmm. life, not really engaging in his own life in some ways. No, of course And not. Jerry, who is ferociously engaged to the point of destruction in some ways mm -hmm. in, in his life. Um, you ought to be a critic. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'm stealing it all from Mel. <laughs> but Mel said that in, in some ways, as, as he was analyzing this play, that there were the two Edward Albies. There was the Edward Alby of Larchmont of privilege, and as you said earlier, the Edward Albee who went a million miles away and became the Edward Albee of the Greenwich Village. Is, is that a fair assessment of the biographical detail of this play? Uh, fairly fair, but not totally. If, if it, even as good a biographer as Mel, mm -hmm. and he was a really good one, an honest, fair guy. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, most biographers make a terrible mistake in assuming that the only place that creativity comes from is from the experience of the writer, mm -hmm. which is such a ridiculous mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, I am not Peter, I am not Jerry. Mm -hmm. I have never put myself in any of my plays. I invent, mm -hmm. I invent characters. The limits to what I invent are, are my own perceptions, what I'm able to, to understand. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he was writing about what created your perceptions. Uh, okay, but he didn't make that point clear. He did say one thing I thought was interesting, um, though, because I'm just interested in the specifics of how a play comes together, that your work as the um, uh, delivery boy for Western Union, especially delivering telegrams... Uh, death messages death to messages, people, sure. ...was quite influential in some ways in your perception. Well, I met an awful lot of very, very interesting people during those three years or so that I was delivering telegrams. Mm -hmm. and At moments of their, in crisis in their lives. Yeah, and most of it was on the, on the, the then not-so-fashionable Upper West Side of New York City. You know, Central mm -hmm. Park West and Riverside Drive were okay, but in those days, in, 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 the, in the 50s, there was a mess in between. I believe Jerry lives up in a rooming house in that he area. He did, of yes, of course, about um, 76th Street, I think. Mm -hmm. so, so the people you met delivering the telegrams float around in your mind oh, as possible? Sure. Characters. But I've always kept my eyes and ears open, you know. I'm going to get assaulted on the subway someday. I take the subway everywhere. It's the only place to get anywhere in New York City. Mm -hmm. And I'm always looking at people and listening to them. 
people are fascinating, uh -huh. you know? Now, when you wrote the zoo story, you then sent it off to Thornton Wilder. No. 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 Thornton Wilder read my poetry before and, right. and told me to write plays, right. which was perceptive of him. Mm -hmm. I think he was just trying to save poetry from me, though. I don't, I don't, think, he, I, I don't right. think he really meant to write plays. He, he could have said anything. Uh, no, I sent it to, um, I only knew composers in those days, basically. I didn't know many writers. And one of the composers I sent the play to was David Diamond, mm -hmm. who just died last year, alas, yeah. a very good American composer who was living in Italy at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, David read the play and liked it a lot, and he sent it to a friend of his, a Swiss-German actor-translator named Pincus Brown, mm. who happened to be married to the daughter of the people who owned, uh, had gotten back after the Nazis were overthrown, a Jewish family, Fisher, who'd gotten back their publishing house, the S. Fisher Publishing House, and he sent it to Pincus Brown, David did, mm -hmm. who translated it and sent it to Stephanie Hunzinger, who was my agent until she died a couple of years ago. Everybody's dying. Yeah, you know? exactly. Um, and she arranged for a production of my play, The Zoo Story, on a double bill with Beckett's play, Crap's Last Tape, in German. In Berlin. In Berlin at right. the Schiller Theater of Eckstadt. Yeah. And so that's how that's the play managed to get its world premiere in, in Berlin. And right. I had to go, of course. And you were on your way. Why, after all these years, have you gone back to the play to write um, Act One? because I'm convinced that I had already written Act One, but I'd never put it down on paper. I thought the zoo story worked pretty well, but I also thought, you know, this is really a little one-sided. <laughs> Peter doesn't have much to say in this play. He's sort of a backboard that Jerry bounces all of his ideas across. Maybe I didn't flesh out Peter enough, and that kept bothering me just a little bit. And finally, about six or seven years ago, it occurred to me, well, why don't you fix it? Why don't you try to write a first act? Peter at home with his wife, Anne, before he goes to the park. Mm -hmm. Let's learn more about Peter. What's the interesting thing is, <clears throat> I still knew who Peter was. I haven't thought about him for 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. And I also knew who his wife, Anne, was, mm -hmm. even though I'd never written a word for her. And I, could, I wrote Home Life in two weeks, because <laughs> I still knew who these people were. Right. I still, I knew their relationship. I'd retained it all these years. Mm. And so it wasn't like adding a new piece to an older play. It was like doing the first part mm. of an older play. Did you do it on the Liberated Western Union? No, I still write, I write by longhand now. You do? It's called manuscript. Yes, <laughs> not on a computer? No, God, no. Hmm. Somebody told me once a long time ago that maybe this is no longer true with computers. Somebody told me a long time ago that if you put something on a computer and you press the wrong buttons, the whole thing will erase. <laughs> I don't want that. No. <laughs> no. Um, the American Dream uh, and the Sandbox at Cherry Lane, mm -hmm. you're directing those plays. Yeah. I've done that before. Yes, I know. You've directed, uh, I think you've directed most of your, most mm -hmm. of your works. Yep. Uh, is the best director of Edward Albee Edward Albee? No, the, the director that gives for the first time around, the most accurate representation of what was going on in the author's mind when he wrote the plays <laughs> is me. Yes. Yeah, I can do that. Mm -hmm. So whenever ever I direct a play of mine, uh, I can be very accurate to my intention, whether that's the best intention in the world or not. Yeah. It was what I intended. And every once in a while, I like to see that. Mm -hmm. Have you direct, you've directed American Dream before at other places over oh, the yeah, years? Oh yeah, sure. Or? And now, Sandbox, uh, both. People have, have written that the American Dream and the Sandbox are uh, you looking at your own family, uh, and, and a young man's bringing forward his very privileged family and his and the problems with well, him. Well, certainly Would both of those play, both of those plays, which are satires, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, are, are a portrait of my adoptive family, yeah, your adoptive the, family. the mother and father whom I did not in, enjoy living with, and my maternal grandmother, who I thought was a lot of fun. She was a hoot. <laughs> yeah. uh, I liked her a lot, sure, uh, but that didn't come out of me. That came out of them. Do you still relate to these characters the same way so many years later? Oh, sure, you have to, of course. There's been no evolution in your, in your perception? No, I mean, I wouldn't rewrite a, a play 40 years after I wrote it because I'm not the same person. Mm. But then you came back to like the, writing about your adopted mother in and Three, three Tall, tall women. women. Well, that was a, a um, real life portrait. Ah, I see. So, mm. what, but not not the satire of no, uh, no, that was it. I mean, is the difference between you know writing about your family when you're young and the, sort of the anger there, and then writing about your family when you're older in a more 
a deeper understanding of why they behave the way they behave? Well, uh, when I got to writing um, Three Tall Women, uh, the anger about my adoptive mother was still there, but I'd added something, a little pity. Yeah. So, uh, in a way, then there was an evolution. The, the yes, yeah, so I wouldn't call it a softening. Mm. I would call it maybe a growing. Mm. Um, me, myself, and I, about identical twins. Yeah, among other things. Among other things, yeah. <laughs> Um, I don't know what the damn play is about yet. <laughs> it's finished though, right? Oh, You're sure. All ready to go? Mm -hmm. um, any, uh, how do you hit on the idea of identical twins then? Is there something? Well, it's interesting. Um, there are identical twins in the American dream. That boy True. who shows right. up yeah, yeah, yeah. is the identical twin of, of the first ki kid they adopted yeah. and, and destroyed psychologically. So mm -hmm. there's an ident there are identical twins there. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? It is. What do you make of that? Uh, I didn't even think about that when I was writing Me, Myself, and I, because I was after a different purpose, a different function of identical twins. Mm. The whole matter of being able to create your own identity and the, the extra question and problem of creating your own identity if you are two people who are the same. Mm, interesting. So that's, it's more about that than, uh, than anything to do with the uh, identical quality that uh, permeated the American dream. How do you think your mind first went on to th thinking about twins? Why were you thinking about twins in the first place? In the American Dream? Yeah. I don't remember. Right. It's a very long time ago. I mean, we ask you, <laughs> it's funny because we ask you to analyze in this way yourself, which is very odd because most great, great writers don't put themselves forward in this way that you're sitting here and, and then we're say, we're, we're trying well, to. I, I can theorize with the best of you them. You can theorize. <laughs> with, but, did, but did the theorizings of your plays ever get in the way of your writing? No. No. Uh, because every play I write, uh, I, 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 I familiarized myself throughout my life with, with theatrical literature. I, I, I know the whole literature of theater, and I'm aware of the fact that I've written what? How many? How many plays have I written now? I don't know, 28 or something like that. 29, 30, 30 with this one probably. Uh, but every time I sit down to write a play, I write the first play I've ever written, ah. mm. and I also try to write the first play that anybody's ever written. And so I completely ignore everything that I know and, and, and go with, with, with whatever want that particular thing needs and wants to be. Mm. But that's a tremendous skill to be able to put yourself in that kind of new place. You have to, or else you're, you're, you're writing thesis. Many you, writers lose that ability. Sure. I mean, I, I mean how, do you, how are you able, is there a technique you use that you're just able to, to sit down and clean your mind in this way and, and, and come to it new? I don't know how it happens. And, since uh, creativity is black magic, it's mm -hmm. probably best not examined yeah. closely. <laughs> right, yeah. It strikes, strikes me, though, that uh, the, the characters are so powerful in the play. I mean, is that where you begin with, with a voice, with a character? I begin with characters and f f find out who they are. And then if I know who they are, really know who they are, then I can trust them to be in the play. Mm -hmm. Then now, I start writing the play. Now, with Occupant, about Louise Nevelson, who was a, you were very close to, I yeah. believe. Um, well, that's a different matter. Yeah, I mean, no, you the same as three tall women. Your mother. And that's yeah. biography. And when you when you when you when you wrote Occupant, were you was this a kind of attempt to understand this friend of yours, or no, she I was such I, a powerful no, personality you wanted to capture? It wasn't an attempt to understand her. I understood her before I wrote the play, or I wouldn't couldn't have written the play. Hmm. So, but it was a she was just a vibrant character that you wanted. She to... She was a fascinating, fascinating woman. Mm -hmm. The complexity of her life, uh, the biography, is so, is, is so fascinating, and. The Louise Nevelson that she created, the eminent you know, sculptor, right? This 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 object that she created for the for the world to see. I was interested in in, in, in an audience seeing what 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 caused that and, and what was underneath it and the difference between the the presented Louise Nevelson and the real real Louise Nevelson. That that fascinated me. This again, and of course, I waited until after Louise died before I wrote it, mm. so she wouldn't hit me. This then again becomes another question, though, as you said, with the identical twins of identity, of creating. I mean, one she she decides she's she's really this, but she's going to become something yeah, else. Yeah, that seems to be something that uh, afflicts a lot of my plays, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is, does it afflict you? I mean, is there the is there the uh, is there the um, uh, private Edward Albee and the public Edward Albee? No, I, I, I with Mel's book, there is no private Edward Albee left. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And so that is a wonderful book, and I get the it's sense a, it's a good book because I, there is no nothing hidden about right. my about my life. I've never. Th thought, seen anything in my life that other people shouldn't know about if they wanted to know about it. And so, and Mel, uh, a first-rate critic, yeah, 
first-rate critic, good mind, and a nice guy, and we were good friends. If, you know, I knew that sooner or later, somebody was going to come along and sure. write a biography about me. That sort of thing happens if you stick around long enough, you know. <laughs> and uh, let's get a good one in there first before anybody can do anything else. Yeah. Uh, George Grizzard, wonderful actor who was the original Nick and who's afraid of Virginia <clears throat> Woolf, uh, died a couple of weeks ago. I was and very fortunate having George in, in three of my plays. Uh, Delicate Balance, mm -hmm. um, Seascape. And Seascape. Yeah, and yeah. Virginia Woolf. Um, I read, though, in Alan Schneider's memoir that you were reluctant to have George play Nick originally because you thought Nick should be more strapping football I remember, linebacker. I remember it differently. I remember being quite taken with, uh, uh, with George's abilities. He was, he was a young guy. He was, what, 28, yeah. uh, 30, when, the proper age uh, when, when he played Nick. I remember, all I remember of it, I don't remember saying to Alan, though I may have, mm -hmm. is he large enough for the role. But I remember uh, George coming up to me saying, do you think I'm too small for the role? <laughs> and I remember saying something, you know, rehearsed and clever, like um, any actor can be any size they want to be and don't worry about it. So, but probably a little truth both there. Maybe, uh, maybe it did concern me that I, th that I had conceived of Nick as more of a bruiser. Mm -hmm. But once George got into rehearsal and I saw the subtlety yeah which he played, and, and, and the aggressiveness that, that he could do so cleverly. I had no problem with having George in the play at all. I'm sorry he had to leave so soon. He, had, he left after three months. Uh, I think subtle is a good w way to describe George. That's oh. the sense I always got watching him. There was never any flashy, actory kind of tricks with no, him. No, I've never seen any better playing uh, Tobias in uh, A Delicate Balance oh, than George. Really? He, was, yeah. he was so wonderful in that. Yeah. I always thought that he had that the upper-class elegance of your characters, but also the kind of anger and em emptiness or, or, or the lost quality about him that is Well, in, he was a first-rate actor. He could play a lot of things. Yeah. He could play more than one thing. I want to ask you a little one last thing, though, about backstage. I always heard that he and Elaine Stritch were at war with each other during a delicate balance. Was that true? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> How bad? Was that a George and Martha situation? I, I can't quote some of the things that George would say to, to Stretch during curtain calls, <laughs> because this is a family program. <laughs> right. Um, all right, uh, Edward Albee, it's always a great pleasure having you on Theater Talk. Don't miss uh, Peter and Jerry, now at Second Stage. Me, myself, and I at the McCarter Theater in Princeton. In January. In January, with a possible New York transfer in the world so. for the spring. The American Dream and uh, Sandbox at the Cherry Lane, which you're directing. Mm. April. And April. And Occupant at the or March, Theater. whichever it is. In March, yes. You know, four plays together. Not not bad for uh, not bad for uh, an 80-year-old. Well, as long as it's not for that. You mean, as long as they're going to stop next year? I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> as long as you don't stop. Uh, Edward, thanks a lot for being our guest. Always My pleasure. pleasure. Tell us a little bit about the character you're playing. I mean, how do you see him and how do you approach him? I see him like a, a, a judge that I knew when I was a little boy mm. from North Carolina who mm. was our congressman. Mm. And uh, he was a, a small town judge and he went to Congress and uh, he got my father an appointment to the government in, uh, in Washington and that's how I in, in, grew up in Washington. And uh, he, he's a small town moral, wily, mm -hmm. southerner. And, uh, and I, you know, I throw in a lot of curly cues of my own, but that's kind of who I have in mind. Mm. How do you find the play uh, hits an audience now? I tell you, my favorite sound in the theater is dead silence, and we get that a lot. Mm. That means they're, they're listening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the things the play brings up, and I think your character struggles with, is the notion of, um, of a victor's justice. I mean, he doesn't come to Nuremberg, the great moral crusader that he becomes at the end. He seems to me to have a little bit une uh, of unease that the victor's imposing our way of looking at the world, our justice system, onto these Nazi judges. Do you agree with that? Do you see your character struggling with that in the play? I hate anything that tampers with natural ignorance. <laughs> 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 I don't, uh, I think there's, there's right and wrong, and mm -hmm. I think this man knows that. Mm -hmm. And uh, he tries his best to give everybody a fair shake. 
and he tries to know the people. He wants to know, you know, the, the German people that I meet in the play, or he's really anxious to know what they're about and what went on in this country. Mm -hmm. And then it gets down to right and wrong, mm -hmm. murder and life. And it's simple. It's very simplistic for me. You see, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't read the books about this period. I don't read about the courtroom things. You don't read the legal arguments. No, the not at all. Mm -hmm. Mm. No, it has, it's a moral issue with me, and mm. that's, what, that's what I deal with. Mm -hmm. George finds all kinds of overtones that I didn't even know were in the play. <laughs> <laughs> I have no <laughs> idea what he means. <laughs> <laughs> but now, but I Just your genius. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. Playbill Online is the official website of Theater Talk and the home of the Playbill Club providing information and opportunities for theater lovers. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you and good night.